Hey everybody, I'm back in the Mustang. I want to talk about an undiscussed reason why they triangulate you against other people. So what we always talk about, we being me and other mythical uh, YouTube channel content authors, triangulation is always seen as a form of manipulation, and it is. Uh, and it's used as a, manip as a manipulation tactic. It's always used to the means of creating a feeling of shame or insult or guilt or proving themselves to be correct. Uh, if you've watched my last few videos, you know that that was sign language, S-I-G-N, shame, insult, guilt, need to be correct, uh, as put forth by Kevin Samuel, a image consultant with his own YouTube channel and um, inarguably narcissistic, whether or not he's a, a toxic, it, narcissist or somebody with NPD is irrelevant. He's an image consultant. Of course, narcissism comes with that territory. Uh, so, but that doesn't, truth, truth is true no matter what mouth says it. And so I really, I'm really, really, uh, uh, I really like the term. I can't, I can't think of a more elegant word. So yeah, I just, I like it. All right. So shame, insult, guilt, because they need to be correct. Uh, so yeah, triangulation can be used as a, as a manipulation tactic. But there's also uh, another source. And this, this ties into some of the other videos I've done about undiscussed uh, attributes of cluster B personalities. <clears throat> So why else would they do it? Well, the rundown, and I'm gonna make this shorter than in the previous videos, but narcissism, whenever it's disorderly, disorderly narcissism, pathogenic narcissism, has its, oftentimes, oftentimes has its roots in borderline personality disorder and comes about as a maladapted coping strategy for borderline disorders or for borderline traits. Borderlines have at their core a very, very profound, extreme and severe fear of abandonment or rejection because it has become a hallmark of their life. They are very emotionally unstable, which with that comes positive and negative instability. They work hard, they play hard, they love big, they fight big. Right? So every emotion that they feel, they feel really big. They feel disproportionate levels of grief and pain for negative emotions. Right? So they can actually feel grief that is on par with funeral level grief over something uh, inconsequential. Like you not like if you don't respond to their text fast enough or if they text you and they don't hear back from you, they will enter into the grieving process. They're grieving because they are predicting the end of the relationship and yeah, all of that. Another hallmark of borderline personality disorder and borderline traits is they must rely upon others to help them regulate their emotional states. So they have no control over it and they have really two options. They can attempt to mitigate it themselves and if they don't do it correctly, then you can get one of the other cluster B disorders such as antisocial or histrionic or borderline personality disorders or narcissistic personality disorder, right? So that's if they attempt to mitigate it themselves without proper guidance, they end up uh, <laughs> they end up with one of the other disorders as well. So one of the, the things that they have to do is they need others to help them regulate their emotional states. We see this all the time in movies, the quintessential jock that's wanting to fight somebody and he's got all of his little, his little friends, they're all in their letter jackets. He's like, let me go, let me go. And they're like, no, he's not worth it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. He's not worth it, man. Right? 
they, they have to have those friends that intervene on their behalf. This is also one of the primary drivers of such things as gossip, right? Because if they need help regulating how they feel about things or people, then they must employ others to assist them in that regard. So they must have personal assistance to help them deal with the emotional challenges of social relationships. And so, yes, there are people who are nosy, who live for gossip, etc., etc. But then there are those who must speak about their relationships to others to help them regulate said relationship, right? That's one of the inroads to gossip. There's also one of the inroads to the smear campaign. That's for another video. Now that I have set the stage, you can start to see the mechanisms for which triangulation starts to set in. Why triangulate? Well, as they are trying to take the average of their interpersonal relationships with others and with you and regulating how they feel about certain things, combine that with their incentive is to avoid negative emotions. So what you're going to have sometimes, 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 not every time, but sometimes, is if they are feeling like if they do not like, so, so they will detect that there is a disturbance in the force. And due to previous experience, they know that if they don't do something about it and nip it in the bud, then shit gets explosive. And so they go to try to the, to the best of their ability, prevent this, you know, uh, explosive future from occurring, right? Sometimes, like I said, this is not every time. This is just undiscussed. And I should point out, this is what higher functioning uh, disorderly people try to do. Even if they're undiagnosed, they know to a certain degree that they're trying to take ownership of the drama and chaos in their lives. And they don't really know how to do it. So, but in any case, they feel the explosion coming. They are seeing it in their future. And what they're trying to do is keep their relationship with you on track and they don't really know how to thoroughly express that especially if they are undiagnosed and unself aware they don't really have all the pieces of the puzzle they just know that the way things are going right now you're in the hot seat for the next relationship that is going to come to an explosive end and what they will do is they will compare you to a different relationship that they have that presently is not predicted to end explosively. And so what they are attempting to do in their feeble way, in their fragile, delicate, maladaptive, unproductive, and uh, you know, ultimately um, ineffective manner is to salvage their relationship in whatever way that they know how. <laughs> they don't know how, and that... That, too, is a big part of the problem. They don't know how to salvage the relationship before it needs salvaging. And if that sounds irrational, that is because it is. So, they begin to triangulate. Because they currently do not feel the threat of an explosive end with this other person. And so, they would like for you to be more like this other person. Because if you could change instead of them, if you can change to be more like this other person, well, then that would be great because then they wouldn't have to change or think too much or too hard about themselves and their problems. And the threat of an explosive end would disappear from their radar. Well, the problem with that is, I mean, of course, there's 
tons of problems with that. Uh, the main one is that it's irrational because it's hard and it's hard enough, if not impossible, to change yourself, especially if you're an adult. You is who you is, and it's if you can't change you, then what the hell makes you think you can change someone else? And certainly. As difficult as it is to change yourself, nobody is going to actually be able to change themselves in the name of helping somebody else's emotional state. Because it's like, yeah, that would be a hugely uncomfortable change for you to go through just to make somebody else feel a little bit better and more secure about themselves and their relationship. No, that's a highly irrational, highly selfish, uh, and, well, frankly, borders on impossible. Uh, one could argue that it is actually even technically impossible to actually change oneself as an adult, but rather just shift your focus from one set of latent potentials into another, and perhaps maybe resurrect some covered over and forgotten potentials uh, and to revive some of the potentials out of your shadow self. So you're not technically changing, you're just now giving precedent to some of your pre-existing traits that you have ignored and um, disavowed or just forgotten about, right? So you resurrect some of the things from your past and pick those things back up. Without, and you haven't changed yourself, you've just changed your focus, right? But it, that's somewhat irrelevant here. I'm just bringing that up. <clears throat> so, there is, again, uh, so I'll wrap all this up. Yeah, triangulation. Sure, you can do it intentionally, especially if you have read any books on dating or even some of the, the less savory books like Dark Psychology, Seduction, uh, things like that. How to play head games with people. Sure. Sure, it, it, can, it can totally be intentional most dating books teach you to do it intentionally but indirectly right there's very clever ways to indirectly triangulate people right and a quick example if i wanted to triangulate uh, a, the pretty girl at work right i would go to the the break room where the coffee is whatever whatever girl that happens to be there I'll be like, oh, hey, your hair looks good. Did you change it? Yeah, it looks nice. Just something nice. Any kind of just you know, random compliment, I, right? And the thing is, my target is not the girl I'm complimenting. My target is the girl sitting over in the corner at the table, the one who did not get the attention. Because now she's going to be, if, if, I'm, if she happens to like me in, in some way, shape, or form, She's going to internalize that. This guy that, that she that has her eye totally just passed her up to compliment some other girl. That's going to mess with her. That's one way how you can tell, you know, mess with people and sort of look for clues and signals. You know, if I go and I compliment one girl on her hair and the, girl, the chick that was at the table that day, you know, maybe she didn't do her hair. She just has it up in a ponytail because life happens. You don't always doll up every single day for work. She shows up the next day with her hair, <laughs> hair curled and or permed and fixed and done up and dyed and all of that stuff. And walk up, hey, how you doing? You know, yeah, you'd be like, notice me. That, that's it. That's indirect triangulation. And, and there's no shortage of examples of that. There's no shortage of books that teach childish stuff like that. But it's childish and it works. And so that's why they teach it. But anyways, <clears throat> that's, you know, intentional triangulation. But there are unintentional uh, reasons for triangulation. It's not always to make you feel guilty. It's not always to shame you. It's not always to make you feel insecure. Sometimes, because we all have our own mental health challenges and struggles. And sometimes, sometimes they, they may be well-intended in their own way but ultimately uh, just because you have good intentions doesn't make an action good and it doesn't excuse it and the mantra that I'm starting to 
uh, to that I that I'm starting to to really like is it's understandable, but that does not make it excusable. So understandable, still inexcusable. But the more you know, right? It's half the battle. Something, something, GI Joe. I'll see y'all on the next video. Please like, comment, or share, and I'll see y'all on the next video.